My favorite. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Fiber Town. This is episode 240. Uh, it's Valentine's Day 2020 and my name is Emily. Welcome to my kitchen if you're brand new. If you're coming back, hey, it's good to see you. Today is my yearly recap of Knit Camp, <laughs> which finished yesterday and today I have a bit of a Knit Camp hangover. Um, it's always one of my favorite times of the year. I love making new knitters. I love connecting with um, high school students, which is something I don't do the rest of the year. I'm mostly with two-year-olds and their parents. And I get to take this week off of work and just kind of delve into a subject I love and hopefully impart some of that to people who have varying amounts of experience with it. Um, this year, lots of experience. It was a very unusual year. I worked almost not at all the first day um, because I had students who most, almost all of the students, only one had zero experience with knitting. So yes, I will be putting in some input from them. They recorded some videos, which I've just now looked at. They're hilarious. Um, I might have to edit out a thing or two, but I'm going to leave them mostly uncut. So, um, that is something to look forward to today. ISW talk, sorry, ISW, knit camp. Independent study week is what the school calls this week. And our particular version of it is knit camp. We also um, had a farm visit this year to Solitude Wool. So lots of chat about that as well. So let's see, um, agenda today. I have a finished object. Yes, I do and some works in progress to talk about, knit camp talk, no spinning, I've just um, not gotten around to that. Um, some sewing, I will be putting in a video I recorded a week ago about my coat that I'm making. Well, it's almost done really. And um, just a few acquisitions. So, okay, Alice needs to go outside now. I'm hoping she's not begging from my parents, but, I'm gonna risk this, I'm gonna pause it, and I'll come right back and we'll talk about this sweater. Hey, so a couple things before we talk about this sweater. Um, are you starting the Wooly Thistle Mitten Cal? I need to get cracking again on my Hufflepuff mitts. Um, these are mitts that I've been wearing a ton. Have I shown them in a while? They are made out of biche et biche yarn, which is, this is the Petite Lamb's Wool. I get this at Looped Yarn Works, which is, I consider my local yarn store. I go there the most often. And I got two of these. I think this yarn, I wear these almost daily and they're holding up incredibly well. So sturdy and good. And these are the underwing mitts and I just recommend this stuff. It's really working out well. So, as I said, this is the Seamless Saddle Shoulder Raglan by Elizabeth Zimmerman. Talked about this in my last episode and I finished it. It took me about three weeks. Here it is in all its oversized glory. And there's that saddle shoulder. Um, that was very fun to knit. It's incredibly oversized, as you can tell. <laughs> I find it so, so, so cozy. It could fit better in the shoulders, but really I have zero complaints. This is exactly what I wanted. The sleeves are cozy over my hands. It goes down to about, I don't know, right under my hip. It's not, it's just perfect. It's perfect. So I will wear this as I chat about everything else that I have to show you today, including these um, West Yorkshire spinners, Socks, which I've just finished the ribbing. These have been on the needles for months, like since the summer. Huge change in my sock knitting this year where I just don't have the mojo. I think my work schedule has increased a lot. I have just a lot less time to knit on socks and I just rather be making other things generally, but I do still love socks. So um, yeah, I, I need to 
crank out at least three or four pairs a year, I think, to maintain my current sock drawer as they, as they get holes that I'm just not willing to darn anymore. Um, and it just happens. I think my socks generally last three years average, some more, some less. Um, but yeah, that's the, so the sock story for right now. The only other work in progress I have is it started life as a new leaf sweater by Jennifer Steingass, and I've since had to modify it. And that is because of the yarn, not the sweater, um, not the pattern rather. Um, this is being knit out of Clun Forest, which was um, a fleece I purchased, I think at Maryland Sheep and Wool. Can't remember, I could look it up done that and um, dyed botanically by me so the main color you might remember my oak iron dye bath that's the main color this was a beautiful white but I didn't want a white sweater so I put this in a dye bath I think if I had left it white the new leaf sweater would have worked it's a colorwork yoke it's intricate and beautiful but um, this yarn just didn't look right with it. So the New Leaf by Jennifer Steingass has a couple of new to me techniques, which I always appreciate. Um, I did a tubular cast on and I kept, I kept a good part of this sweater from, um, from that initial try of the New Leaf. So what else was different? Um, th that wasn't different. I mean, I've started trying to use more tubular cast ons because it's not that much more work. Um, it did have a new to me increase where you pick up, um, well, it wasn't that new, but I think I'd done this before, but I hadn't done it in ages where you pick up a leg from a stitch in the row below and you knit into it to increase. Um, according to Jen, this makes a, a flat increase. And I think the jury's out on how it looks in hand spun. <laughs> quite frankly, but it's all right. I'm willing to try it. So I knit the short rows and then I knit about an inch or two of the color work, ripped it out back to the short rows and decided to do garter stitch, a garter stitch yoke. Now I should have, here's the front of the sweater. Looks okay, right? Here's the back. I think the garter stitch is just, this is the reverse stockinette side. <sighs> not sure this one looks better to me and I think what I should have done is start on the right side with the contrast color and a knit round rather than a purl round so that this would have looked more like this but I'm going to leave these tails hanging I'd sort of braided them together which I think that could be a design feature right just braid your yarn ends um, I might the finished sweater might be reverse stockinette with the garter. I need to put it on needles and see how it looks on the yoke so far. I think the yoke is about halfway done. It's an eight inch depth before the armholes. And in the shortest part of it, which is in the front, it's probably four and a half inches right now. So yes, so the, um, the garter stripe just shows off this botanically dyed yarn much better. So we have marigold and coreopsis, oh, beautiful. We have fresh indigo, double dipped, and it really looks bluer next to the yellow. We have a yeast vat with my woad leaves, that's that pink. And then a single dip indigo, which you can see, it's kind of a minty. Let's see, where, where does it look best? Against the yellow? It's very light minty. And then of course the mane. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not sure how it's gonna look, but I'm enjoying the knit. I'm using US 8, um, US 8 needles and doing garter stitch in the round. So that's a lot of fun. Um, I will be casting on the Bressa by Marie Wallen at some point in the future. I have a cone of, I can't remember if it's Bartlett Yarns or Harrisville fingering weight purple for the body of that. And then Jameson's of Shetland for the yoke. 
and I'll be casting on with my podcaster friends, Sarah Pomegranate, Fibertrack, Wooly Thistle, some undetermined date. So if you want to knit along with us, that would be great. Probably around, probably cast on around April or May, early May. Oh, Alice is over here licking her paws. She's going to get an allergy shot later in the day. It should be fun. I think I mentioned that on the last podcast. She's very itchy this winter. And I think it's house plants. I don't know for sure. Anyway, that is neither here nor there. But that's it for my knitting today. Oh, hey, hello, friend. Alice loves the knit campers. So I think she's a little, oh my goodness, oh, your poor face. She just adores them. So yeah, so the knit campers, let's talk a little bit about how it went every day. Like I said, the first day I cast on hats for everybody out of Malabrigo Worsted, which is a single. I call it the gateway wool because it's soft and um, saturated in color and really gorgeous, but still wool. You know, it's not super wash wool. Um, so it kind of gets you in the door, inter being interested in wool. And it's great for hats. It doesn't take um, abrasion well, so hat is a really good application for it. So I cast on and knit a ribbing, and then the kids, I think one of them, I think Maggie might have finished the hat that first day. Um, and other techniques learned there while they're learning how to do the knit stitch and manage the needles, um, or decreases, switching to double points, and then um, you know weaving in with a tapestry needle and weaving in ends. Um, so two of them finished two objects this week. Um, like I said, everybody but Zoe had knitting experience, which is quite unusual. Um, so the second day I did have, you know, running around putting, you know, teaching new techniques and um, helping fix mistakes, but not a lot of them. And Tuesday was our dye day. So we did two types of dyeing. We did um, I got some superwash worsted weight, which would go with the needles that the kids already had. And I got it from Webs this year. It was their Valley Yarn Superwash um, worsted weight. A very round, it looks like, like it's at least four or five plies. Here it is, this is mine that I dyed. And we, I did this later because I had started a, a cochineal bath. Look at that color from cochineal gorgeous, right? Anyway, usually I get the worsted weight from knit picks, and this is far superior, far better. Um, so I will be doing that if I do knit camp again. I'll get it from um, yarn.com. Um, so we did acid dyeing, and oh my gosh, the dyeing was gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, my daughter, Gabby, she dyed like a koi pond colorway. It was beautiful, um, and I will insert a picture. Here because she forgot to show it um, when she recorded or she didn't forget she just didn't have it uh, and she is knitting it into a cowl um, Reese oh my gosh so gorgeous really beautiful like go into business Reese dye some yarn and sell it on the internet um, Maggie adventurous Maggie probably the most experienced knitter there she did a technique where um, she balled up some yarn and inserted it into a Dive, like a black dye bath. Um, it was so tightly balled up that the dye didn't penetrate as much as she wanted, but it's still gorgeous and was like, like a very cool risk to take to try something experimental. Um, oh my gosh, what else? Eliza's yarn was like cotton candy beautifulness. Um, thinking who else oh Zoe's was a gorgeous um, blues and pinks too and she's knitting fingerless mitts and then Jared's was like blues and grays and just gorgeousness um, Clara oh Clara what did yours look like I'm trying to remember did I hit everybody else um, Maggie Eliza Gabby Zoe Jared Reese Clara Clara's was a beautiful, um, oh gosh, what did she do? I took pictures and she, I think she's going to show it. Why can't I remember Clara's? Clara, I'm sorry. 
um, pictures are on my phone, which I'm using to record. But I think she shows it in the video. They are hilarious. Anyway, the second part of dyeing was botanical printing on silk scarves. And this is mine. Um, I used this sort of pincushion flower, really dark purple, and it came out great. I just bought some, some flowers at Trader Joe's as well as used my dried marigolds and some woad leaves. Did I do woad leaves? I was curious about what the dried woad leaves would do, and I think it was like a faint green color. I don't think I can show you any really, really well on this. A lot of the kids used cochineal, which we have um, a dedicated grinder, like coffee grinder for dye stuff. And um, so cochineal was used. And that's what I used after the fact to dye the leftover skein of yarn. It's amazing. So I immediately, it was such a strong dye bath that I immediately put a bunch of other silks in there, including, oh, did I bring it? Yes, including um, a couple scarves that I had previously dyed with like eucalyptus and marigold. I really love pink and yellow together. So this is super wrinkly, but look, can you see those, the eucalyptus? Oh, it's just not, it's just not showing to its best effect. It's more like this in real life. Yeah, so that was beautiful. Super enjoyed the cochineal and I have more. This was a, a silk top that I made sort of a pajama top. So the cochineal I got from Dharma Trading Company. There it is. And it's from a family cooperative in Peru. They're the little bugs. And they just make this beautiful magenta dye when you grind them up. So that was something new this year. That was nice. Um, let's see, Wednesday. What did we do Wednesday? Well, um, there was like second and third cast-ons happening. Oh, we did the silk dyeing on Wednesday. Um, Thursday, our final day, was a visit to Solitude Wool. Gretchen, the shepherd is there, does not typically do visits. So we were super honored to, um, to be allowed to come to her small holding. I guess that's what you say in the UK, right? Her croft, her homestead. I think that's how she described it, her homestead. She has a small flock of Romneys. I feel like it was like eight to 10 sheep. And we got to spend quality time with these beautiful animals and look into a couple fleeces. We looked into jasmines. I'm gonna show a picture. Um, and we got to open up mochas. No, sorry, I wanna call her mocha. Moose, like chocolate moose, who is the queen of the flock and where others, or she leads others follow. This is Moose. And one thing I didn't know about Romneys was, look at their ears, look at the little woolly bits on the ear. Just so sweet. And um, we also got to spend some time feeding the goats, which are alpine dairy goats. And then Gretchen took us inside her beautiful home and gave us tea and blueberry muffins and a really excellent wool lesson, which I had done some with the kids on that Wednesday where we looked at different fleece samples and tried to identify what was in them, uh, or different yarns rather. And then, but Gretchen took it to the next level and did it from a shepherd's perspective. And I know the kids are going to talk about things they learned. So, um, so yeah, I'm just gonna insert their little bits right here and I hope you guys enjoy. And I'll see you after to talk about sewing. Hi! <laughs> uh, we are some of this. the Marais students uh, in Mrs. Estrada's knitting class. <laughs> Um, ISW. ISW, and we wanted to show you some of the work that we did. Uh, Reese, do you want to start off? Yeah, so we all started with um, hats. Mr. Strata did the ribbing for us to get us started because we didn't know how to knit, but um, we finished them off. I think they look pretty good. This is mine. Zoe and I both put a stripe on her. So I had gray as my color, um, but I really wanted to like spice it up a little bit. 
So I took some of Zoe's <coughs> red, and she, uh, Mrs. Strada taught me how to like knit it into the thing. So then I put a red stripe on my hat. I have a pink hat. <laughs> um, it's nice and cute. <laughs> I think it fits. It might be a little tight, but uh, it was really fun to make it. It was like very satisfying to see it build up. <laughs> yeah. So something that I learned throughout this process yeah, like, um, was. Oh, oh, do you have something else? We have more we things that we've made. Oh, okay. We've got, we have our... So next we Wait, made... I, I, I silk scarf. Yeah, he did. Then we made these scarves. That my ears? That's mine. Can you stop walking? That's mine. <laughs> so, oh my god. Okay, next we made these silk scarves and we used... Um, Reese, don't like, show yours. <laughs> <laughs> mine didn't turn out to turn. Yours is more poopy than mine. No, look at you. It's so All right, they're just bullying each other at this point. <laughs> we made... So they're dyed with um, plant dyes from Mrs. Strada's garden, and we used some bugs. Yeah, so it turns out that there's a lot of um, yes. color inside of and dried bugs, and so we used the powder um, as one of our colors, and it produced a really nice magenta color. A lot of the colors, like, you put on blue flowers and then make, like, a yellow color once you actually let it set. So, like, the colors were, like, unexpected, but... It's a fun process. <laughs> you just like try it out and see what happens. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why you guys are saying mine is. No, okay. <laughs> you're really, like diarrhea on your <laughs> I know. I know. I felt like. What was my thing? I had like this like Maribel. Marigold. Marigold. <laughs> Whatever. I was thinking of yarn. Okay. Um, um, and then, then we dyed our own yarn. So we had <laughs> we white yarn and we just like dyed it. So here's mine, and I'm working on a second hat. I really do like your color scheme, though, Reese. I think it is top notch. Oh, Thank my you. crochet is in here. Um, so, something that I learned throughout this process that I was really interested about, or that I, that I found really interesting, uh, were gonna... the properties of wool and how useful wool can actually be. It's super absorbent, can be very strong. Um, even when it's wet, it can keep a lot of heat. Just and, and sometimes I think that's forgotten when talking about wool, especially with the rise in uh, synthetics. So yeah. Yeah, I thought, I didn't realize how different, like, how there's so many different kinds of wool that come from different sheep or that are spun differently, and how that affects, like, the final result and what they're used for, or what the, um, yeah, whatever you make is used for. I think something that I learned was just, like, how much time and effort it takes to actually, like, work with wool, and how much of a lifestyle it actually is for people that are interested in it. Um, That's true. Just getting a sense of, like how much there is to actually learn and master in the art of spinning wool and um, weaving and everything, just creating. And, and today we um, uh, we went to a farm and we actually got to oh, see facts. the process from the beginning to end where we uh, saw the sheeps, uh, the Romney sheeps, and uh, we saw some goats too, and goats would be used for casual. They were like that. so pregnant. They were so <laughs> I thought cute. they were gonna burst. They were so cute. They ate the, the <coughs> stuff out of our hands. They were like, oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, sheep are sheep are very. They were very shy um, and dirty. But inside, I didn't know. I always thought that like getting the the fleece from the sheep was like not the most sanitary because on the outside they're so so dirty but she like split open the fleece and inside it was like insanely clean and super soft um so i guess that's what they used but i didn't realize that that was actually what they took from the fleece <laughs> like that there's <laughs> stuff inside that was clean so i think we're <laughs> um, thank you wait, so wait, much, Mrs. Strada. Thank this, you this very ice much. Thank is you. amazing. And we're gonna it was... send you a little lookbook of all the different looks that you can, like the ways <laughs> you can wear the scarf, different styles of wearing a maybe beanie. not Reese's. Scarf.
Hi, Hi, we're on a bus. I'm Zoe. I'm Gabby. I'm Emily's daughter. And I'm a friend of Gabby who is in the ISW that Ms. Estrada is running. Yes. Um, this is a hat that I knit. This is a hat that I knit. Um, I really like the color of this one. Um, we I agonized a lot over trying to pick it out online. Um, and tell them about your stripe. Oh yeah, um, so this is a stripe that is was made in um, conjunction with my friend Jared, who also put a red stripe in his, and so this is vermilion, and this is polar morn, which is apparently very, very sought after, after color. Yeah. Um, and I'm really proud of myself for knitting this hat, because I actually learned how to knit on Monday for the very first time. Mm -hmm. um, would you hold this for a sec? Yeah. And now I'm currently knitting, with the yarn that I dyed myself, a fingerless glove. And you mm -hmm. see on this side I'm doing, like, knitting and purling, which is so exciting, because I never, not in a million years, thought I would be the kind of person to knit. But here I am. Yeah. A knitter. <laughs> and I'm knitting. I don't have it with me right now. It's at my house. But I dyed <laughs> I dyed a skein of yarn um, that I'm sure my mom will, like, put up pictures or something because I'll, I'll send them to her. But I'm knitting a cowl. Um, and I'm, I, like... Cowl's moving hassle. <laughs> Shut up! Pardon me. <laughs> Hello, um, viewers. Okay. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, and it's really nice, and um, the dyeing was really fun. Um, especially the, the, like, the, we made, like, silk, silk scarves, which actually... Oh, I have my silk scarf. Yeah, I have mine, too. Wait. Maybe we can just edit this part out, I don't know, but... Do, 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 do,
I learned how to purl, and it's fun. Purling is fun. It's it's like knitting, but, but like backwards. In, it's not even backwards. It's like you take it from the middle and you like like it's like it's like um yes tinkini. <laughs> yeah, because you know I, I words visually. So you take the word knitting, oh. <laughs> and you take the T's and you like kind of scoop them up, and then it's like tinkini. Yeah, I mean that makes sense a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. It really doesn't. <laughs> But anyway, um, red is my favorite color. I made a red hat. I made a green hat because I, I thought it would go with green. my eyes, and it does. I have green eyes also. Uh, you have blue eyes. What are you talking? They're about? green, actually. Oh, they are kind of green. So you are turning the brightness left. <laughs> <last? laughs> That's ter- terrifying. It's the first thing you see before you die. <laughs> the last thing. Last thing before you die. <laughs> the first thing you see before you die is like womb. Ew. Oh, yeah, that is true. We're in the womb. We in the womb. Ratatata. <laughs> Ratatata. <laughs> so, yeah. That, it was a fun time. I'm glad we did this. I wish we could do it again next You're year. You're so short. I'm not. I'm just slouching. I have bad posture. Don't make fun of me. Um, But, yeah, it was a really fun time. I really enjoyed um, it. It was a really good experience. Sorry about all these... Um, yeah, you should apologize to, you me, have to, to the edit. audience. <laughs> Hi, audience. He- <laughs> um, If you see this... Um, you should follow me on Instagram. Um, um, yeah, that's that's it, I think. Should we say bye? Bye. On three. Ready? Oh, wait. One, One two, two, three. three. Bye. bye. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Eliza. Um, we just did the String Theory ISW, um, and we're here to show you some of the stuff that we made. Um, so I made this hat, um, another hat that is blue, um, and right now I'm working on, um, a present cowl, um, which just has a lot of purling and knitting, um, and it's made out of this yarn that we spent a day dyeing, um, so this is dyed by us with, um, a bunch of different dyes that she had set up in hot water and stuff, um, and then we also, we kind of dyed these silk scarves. Um, and so the patterns on here, we used flowers, leaves, um, and this natural dye made out of like crushed beetles that makes this kind of like pinkish, purplish dye. All right, so I made um, this hat as well. You might be able to tell that Eliza and I traded <laughs> yarns about halfway through. So I made these, uh, both of these hats, and then I started this, um, which, as Eliza was explaining, is from my dyed yarn. Um, and then I also made a scarf um, out of some of the flowers, dried flowers and not dried flowers, um, that we had set up. Um, okay, I think we also have some some questions we're supposed to kind of talk about our processes, processes. <laughs> um, I think, uh, for me, this was really fun. I have knitted so the actual like knitting portion of it um wasn't too difficult but it was very (laughs) it was very relaxing it's been like a really long time since I've had the chance to actually sit down and knit for a while um I also haven't made like big hats before I made some baby hats um (laughs) because my aunt works for um or works with a hospital that has a program called the Purple Hat um, program for for babies who are premature. Um, so I made a bunch of hats for them, but I have never made a hat for myself, so that was really fun. Um, do something easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I too had knitted before, um, and I liked how for the hats it was on a circular, um, I guess it's kind of wire or plastic, and then um, actual needles. So before where I've just knitted scarves, you kind of do it on one and then you have to switch to the other one, but I really liked the circle um, needles because it was just kind of continuous and you didn't have to stop and adjust, you could just keep going, um, which I too found very relaxing, but I thought that was easier than some of the other knitting that I've done. Um, okay, and then for me, I think I, I've never done anything with like dyeing before, which was really cool, and I really had a, I had a good time doing that. Um, I think it was a little difficult to try and control what I was doing because I was doing something kind of experimental where I kind of wrapped the yarn in a ball and dyed like the outside so there would be kind of like a gradient going in and it ended up kind of dyeing like spots going in which I think is a really cool effect 
Um, the only thing is this, it doesn't go that far in, so if I were to do it again, I'd probably try and poke more holes, like, in, farther into the yarn. Um, so that was a little bit challenging, um, but I think definitely really rewarding for me. I don't know about you. Um, so I think we had kind of, she started the first hats for us, um, that had this kind of, like, ribbing on the bottom that I really like. So then when I did my second one, I attempted to do that, and I ended up with this. I guess she called it like a moss stitch, um, cause I just did not follow the purling <laughs> and the knitting, um, well enough to make an actual ribbing. So I found in just kind of counting and keeping track, um, I think was a little bit harder for me. Um. Hey everybody, this is my coat. This is the Yates coat. No, no, you're not coming up which I'm going to talk about at length, about all the guts and the details um, in a clip I'm going to insert in a minute. But since I've made that clip, I finished the coat except for the fastenings. I think I'm going to try buttonholes. <sighs> I wore this out <laughs> to Trader Joe's the day I finished it to buy some flowers for a dye day. I could not be happier. Um, the one thing I'm not sure about is the sleeves. I think it may have been a mistake not to interline them. Um, because they are a little warbly. They are a little warbly, but they're not constricting, which was my main concern. And so I gotta be happy with that, right? I made the size 14 and it's roomy and just wonderful. And I am thrilled with all the little techniques I learned and just, yeah, I'm super happy with it. So if you want to know more about all of the details, I will insert that very soon. But just a couple of bits. I mentioned, um, I mentioned this book, really good book. So much to learn here. Couture Sewing by Claire Schaefer. Um, couture Sewing Techniques, rather. So as I say in the video, I'm not sure if I did all this right, but, um, it's, it's good enough. Um, but I learned a lot from that book. As far as my next project, I'm gonna make pants out of this. I'm not sure which pattern. This is a Ventana twill from Robert Kaufman. It's sort of a mid-weight um, twill weave. It doesn't have stretch. Yeah, it's non-stretch. So I'm gonna get cracking with that. But another sewing project I have first is making a dog sweater and this will be for Al. I used a, well, I've been thinking about making her a Fair Isle sweater, but I really don't want to knit a Fair Isle sweater for Alice. However, I have this, which I do not wear. This is, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the pattern. It's by Isolde Teague. It's just a Fair Isle vest made out of Jameson's and Jameson and Smith. I just don't wear it. I'm not a, I'm not a vest person. I did it as sort of an experiment. I wanted to seek armholes and that sort of thing. So this is going to become a sweater for Alice. And I found a tutorial. It's, I'll link it below. It's like make D DIY. Anyway, it's an Australian young woman. Um, she, maybe she's in fashion school or something. And she shows how to take measurements and draft a sweater for your dog. So these are Alice. This is a seam, seam allowance I accidentally cut. Um, yes, so this is totally, can you believe this little thing will go on my pup? Um, so very mathy, <laughs> using, see, using pie and different measurements to make armholes. And then you open it up, you cut two out of your fabric, you use some of the ribbing to do little cuffs for the legs and for the neck. So I'm going to cut into this and make her. I think it looks gorgeous on her. I already put the sweater on her. It looks wonderful. So cut into something to fit her will be excellent. So that will come and then I'll make some pants. So one last acquisition to share with you before I put in my um, nitty gritty of my coat making. And that is this linen that I found at a new to me store that is very close to my home 
look at that. You can't really see, but it is um, a blue warp and a gold and yellow weft. And this is really amazing linen. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yes, about five miles from my home is a store that I had heard about like a year ago. It's fairly new um, and it's in a warehouse. It's called Haute Fabrics, like Haute Couture, Haute Fabrics. And I didn't go because it was billed as upholstery. And I'm just not interested in interior de design that much, but I recently bought, we recently bought um, two couches that we purchased over the Thanksgiving sales um, to replace our one geriatric Ikea sofa from 15 years ago. It's a miracle that thing is still kicking. It's now in the studio. But now we have these amazing sofas and they're just so good. And we waited for about three months to have them delivered. Um, they were made in the US um, with the fabric we wanted. But the cushion fabric was not what we wanted. Um, there weren't any good options. We got the one we liked the most, but then I'm thinking maybe I'll make cushion covers in a different fabric. So I went to this place. Maybe I'll insert some footage because, oh my gosh, it's not just upholstery fabrics, but it's not a curated place at all. Um, there are some hanging bolts. I mean, those are in the, st in the warehouse, but it's mostly fabrics arranged in rainbow order around the entire perimeter of the warehouse, like six, seven, eight bolts deep against the wall. You could spend a year in there. Maybe you'd see everything. It was amazing. I happened to see this linen because it had been taken out and laid against like something. Wow, just a really cool place. Like just get lost in there. Um, super knowledgeable people working there. Um, yes, a lot of upholstery stuff being done. Tons of trim and ribbons and tassels and um, they do custom upholstery as well. Yeah, so I'll be back <laughs> when I have a few hours to get lost in there. Really fun place. I found, I did see some bark cloth, um, which would make amazing sort of structured vintage, like 1950s, 60s dresses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to mention um, Gretchen at Solitude. I'm just looking at these now. She let the kids take away some breed specific yarn. This is a Tunis single. This is a Coopworth, which is my favorite of the ones they do. I also got a Caracol, which I think is in a different bag, but very excited about that too. She taught us so much. Um, yeah. So it's been a really amazing month. And I think Alice wants to say hi real quick. Maybe she can say hello to the Knit Campers too. Hi, baby. Yeah, see so your face is puffy. Don't worry, honey. Today we'll get you fixed up. So, my sweetie. So we will say well, goodbye until next time. And if you want to hear all about the coat making, stay tuned. And we'll see you probably in March. Take care. Hello, everybody. Um, checking in to show you the guts of my Yates coat before I get to the next stage of it. So I hardly know where to begin. So let's start with this, the pattern. It's the Yates Coat by Grainline Studios. And I, I have it right here on Pam. Let me bring her over. I should have done this already. This is the lining. I'll show you that first, shall I? So the lining is a bit of, excuse me, I'm st still waking up, oh my goodness. <clears throat> It's a bit of a hodgepodge of different fabrics. I have this um, rayon Bemberg for the sleeves, which I really dislike. And I dislike working with it, but I wanted to use it for the sleeves because it does give that really nice glide. And I had it in scraps in, um, enough for the sleeves. The sleeves are made in two pieces. And the rest of the lining is this cotton lawn from Sevenberry and it's just a very fun polka dot. Um, and then 
the lining also comprises sort of this collar piece and the front lapel facings. It ends like this so that you can um, attach the, um, the hem facings, which I haven't done yet, but obviously. And I'm not quite sure how that works, but that's the lining. So then that goes on. It's funny, when you birth a coat, you bring the lining out through, no, sorry. You bring the main shell of the coat out through the lining, like a little hole in the lining. And in this particular coat, it'll be on the sleeve. I said these sleeves are in two pieces, which is like how a lot of sleeves used to be made. I, I believe I've been discovering a lot about um, not really a vintage sewing in the sense of dressing vintage, but the way construction used to be done. So it just makes for a better fit. I did modify the seams on the sleeves. Um, to between like a quarter and three eighths inch, which just does change up a bit how the two pieces meet at the arm side. Um, wait a minute, is this right? No, this is wrong. This is wrong. <laughs> when I wear it, when the coat is all put together, it will actually be, oh, well, I, I should have just left it on, but it'll actually be facing like this, yes like this. So all of those raw edges will be on the inside. So I didn't do, I did do lining on the facings and you'll see this particular fabric lining um, in this, in the shell as well. So this is just a, like a pretty medium weight skewing towards heavy linen that I also had in my stash. I didn't want to use fusible interfacing. Um, and really, I have, um, I should have brought the book with me, but I've been using the internet as I do, as well as the Couture Sewing Book by Claire Schaefer to sort of guide me. And I'm still winging it. I, there's a lot that I don't know if I'm doing right. Anyway, so this will be attached to the coat, to the main shell, and then these will be, boop, the front lapels. So here is the rest of the coat. So these will be here. Um, I am very pleased with this collar. Let me just show you the collar. Take it off. Look at that back collar piece. Look at that. This was meant to be underneath here, but I just love this chevron where I joined two pieces. This piece underneath here is all in one, but I just I changed it up and I put that on the outside. And it sits perfectly. So in addition to the white linen lining, I also used a horsehair canvas that I showed last time. And I'm not entirely sure that I cut this on the correct grain because it behaves differently on, from usual woven fabric. Um, it's, anyway, it's a little more flexible across the warp strangely and if you get those horse hairs poking out in a particular place in the coat and you could maybe feel them through the lining so you have to be cognizant of how you're cutting um, a particular piece um, basically for the structure of of the horsehair canvas that you want but also those hairs coming out because they're pretty pokey see pretty pokey horse hair horse hair from tails of horses, um, which I think just come out when you comb them. Um, and then the rest of this is cotton, I believe. And it costs a pretty penny. I got it from Bespoke Bias in New York City, I think. So I used the horsehair canvas in that upper collar. I don't have any in the lining, but I do, um, and I actually pad stitched everywhere I used horsehair canvas, is that? Yes, that is true. So pad stitching is this. Take this off so you can see. Thank you, Pam, I'll get you in a minute. So pad stitching, 
this is my version of it. <laughs> it's not perfect. Um, you do it in smaller increments towards like this is towards the roll line, which is where you want the lapel to roll out. So I have my horsehair canvas here and I pad stitch it. It's just this sort of chevron stitches. I just drew lines and stitched. Um, and then as you are stitching it, you kind of roll the, the fabric with your fingers on, as you're holding it underneath. It makes an incredible difference. I wish I had like that collar piece, like when I had this, like one half of it pad stitched and one half of it not, the difference was really visible. But, so it does help um, sort of soften the fabric so you get structure, but it's not like robot fabric. Does that make sense? It does to me. Then I use this um, twill ribbon to cover it's sort of the border where the canvas meets the linen. And again, to cover up any of those hairs. Yeah, so, so I cut these particular ones. So up here, I'm not getting any pokies, a ah, few. But I used a catch stitch on the ribbon there. I'm pretty pleased with that. So you're just sort of picking little bits of the fabric as you do the catch stitch, as well as the pad stitch. <clears throat> now this fabric on the outside, so this is gonna be down, so you're not gonna see those picked stitches, but this fabric is quite forgiving of that because of the weave. I think you can maybe see one right there, but doesn't matter. Um, and then I did this, I think this is called the back shield. I used a piece of canvas there too, and I just did sort of a running stitch in vertical lines. Um, this one didn't need to roll or anything. Maybe I should have done a pad stitch here, but I'm fine leaving it this way. And I did catch stitch on a different type of ribbon here, a really big catch stitch. Um, and this was not a, well, I guess it was a twill, but it was a little stiffer. You can see it doesn't want to curve easily at the top. But on the back, you notice nothing. So I did a ton of hand basting, hand stitching in this coat, and I used this thread. Very fortuitously given to me by my friend Nare, um, she who gives me fiber stuff as she cleans out her fiber stash. She was a textile student at Rhode Island School of Design a long time ago. So one interlining, so this is called interlining. You just apply the fabric, baste it on around the perimeter. If it's a canvas like this, you can stitch it on. This really doesn't need it because you can treat, I mean, didn't need to stitch these two together. The hand basting really gives you a lot more control about what, over what happens. And I feel like, you can see my, my basting down there. So the silk, silk thread is what is recommended by couture sewing teachers. So I was like, perfect. Um, and I love that this is, <clears throat> this is all natural materials except for the sleeves. Uh, <clears throat> what else can I tell you? I was super thrilled. I want to talk about the sleeves. I was thrilled to pattern match this wool plaid pretty well throughout the body. Um, the f I'll put this on and show you, shall I? And then I want to talk about the sleeves. Okay. Ugh, goodness. Okay. I made the choice not to interline or interface the sleeves. And as I said, I did... Oh, I should have said this is a size 14. I first made a size 12 muslin. I did all the pattern pieces in size 12. And I had to modify around the hips because my hips are 14. Or they're not a 14, they're 43 inches. Is that right? Something like that. That's a true measurement, 14 is made up. Okay. Um, yes, look at that. So. The lapels open at mostly the same spot as far as plaid lines. Um, 
Oh, back to the sleeves. I'm so distracted. There's so much to tell. I was not able, given yardage constraints, to match up the two sleeve pieces. Now, also, what the under piece is cut on the bias. Actually, the top, the top piece, when you get towards the sleeve cap, is also a bit biased. So those plaids were never gonna match up. So I had to let that go. Let's see how this one looks. Yeah, I think I got it more. No, I never matched this one anymore. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it doesn't match here either. Oh, it's a little closer. I got these two, wait a minute. These pink lines match. And look at that shoulder chevron. Did I get a shoulder chevron over here? A little bit, right there. Anyway, so these are the lapel facings. They will go here, like that. And I just love this, um, okay. this upper collar. I just think it's so jaunty. Um, okay, so I'll stand up and show you the plaid matching. I think I'm happy that I didn't interline the sleeves. I mean, there's a lining, you know, the sleeve lining is in here as well. I feel like it gives enough bulk and it'll leave room for sweaters under here. Okay, <clears throat> so these are, these are, um, where are my tailor's tacks? Oh, I think I took most of the tacks out. I had tailor's tacks in here to mark where the pockets go. But yes, this right, when you get to the pocket line, is a second cut piece down here, this bottom piece. So I matched up these and I matched up here. It's wee bit off here. Yeah, it matches around the back as well. Pretty happy about that. Um, yeah, there's that side. A little bit off, but good there. But mostly very pleased. Okay, so let's talk about the shoulders. Okay, should, should have a hairband. Which one, okay, do you notice a difference? Okay, look at this sleeve. It's not been pressed. It's been set in, but not pressed. Same over here. Do you notice a difference between the two? This one's kind of sad and droopy. Sad and droopy. Perky. It's because I used a sleeve head. I did consider using some horse hair along the arm side, but I think I'm gonna leave it because these sleeve heads seem to do the trick. I got these at, from a company called Wawak, but you could absolutely make your own. And I think I'll just cut out some wool fleece next time. Uh, sorry, felt, felt. Um, you just sew these into the seam up here and they just give, it's not a shoulder pad, it gives structure to the sleeve head. And that's what they're called, sleeve heads. These are 14 inch and they just kind of go around. Can you see it in here? I'll take it off because it's hot. I take all you off. Oh my goodness. Um, so these are Taylor's tacks actually that I still have to mark. You're supposed to put snaps on this coat, but I think I'll try a buttonhole. I'll do it. I'll do a mock-up first. <laughs> it's a lot of layers of fabric to go through. Um, <sighs> yes. I don't want to do big snaps, like fabric covered snaps. So I'm going to have to look around for a way to close this coat up better. Okay. Oof. There's my sleeve head that's already been set in. So after I finish talking to you all, I will set in the other sleeve head and then I will proceed to, let's see, where am I in the instructions? I'm here. Hem facing, sewing those together and then lining the coat so everything gets set up and then that happens and then yes you pull everything through a little gap in the lining and then you sew in the sleeve lining pretty cool hopefully it'll all go well <clears throat> now i've been working on this coat for approximately three weeks and that has taught me a lot. And I will just say, put you back up here. I want to say that one of the things I have loved about sewing garments is the quickness of it. 
and I have seen a couple of YouTube channels of sewers, sewists. These people are churning out dozens of garments a month, and it gives me pause. They cannot be well-made, well-finished. <clears throat> you know, I'm not about perfect finishing either, but that many garments is it's a little scary. Like, you don't need that much. Um, <clears throat> I'm not kidding, dozens of garments. And just the fabric involved and the waste involved much, must be pretty staggering. That said, I really do like how fast you can make clothes especially as a knitter. You know, I have my slow craft and sewing is definitely faster. <clears throat> but this, you cannot rush it if you want to do it right. And hopefully I'm mostly doing it right. I really am mostly self-guided with this. So I'm sure there are things that I should have done differently. But so far I'm liking the result and I have been able to take my time with it. So the pad stitching, the basting, the interlining, um, you just can't rush it. And it's made me calm down and take my time. And at the beginning, it was rough for me to get started with this. And then it, once I did get started, it was difficult to have that attitude of, take a breath. I'm gonna do one thing tonight after work. And slowly doing that over several weeks, I got to be okay with the with the with the speed of things um, once I started to see it come together especially so I would love to finish this weekend that said you know I, I I'm really in the home stretch but then I think they're gonna be finishing things and the closures so I just would like to get to the home stretch because I'm doing my knit camp this week um, and I I've had to leave all of this sort of project stuff out in a mess, which I've been able to clean up a bit now since all the pattern pieces are cut. Um, that was the thing, I didn't cut the sleeve pieces until I got the rest of this body together just so I could see how I could best match plaid lines. I will say working with wool fabric is Wonderful. I'm pretty sure this is 100% wool. I got it in Montreal this summer at Couture Carlisle. And I had the best time in that store. And I have another cut of wool from them. Enough to make like a, <clears throat> a Chanel style jacket. And now I want to totally do that right, like with the chain and everything. Um, it's a black wool with just a white stripe. This was three yards feel like I should have gotten three and a half. I would have had more options for, um, for the sleeves, but it's okay. I really had very little left over. Um, so it got the most out of the wool yardage. Um, I was given that silk thread, but I did buy two new tools for this. Hi, May. My husband said, why did you buy a wooden anvil? why wouldn't I buy a wooden anvil? This is a clapper and point presser. So you stick your lapels or your collar points on here. So this will be great for Cali shirts as well. And you sort of mold the fabric around here as you steam it with your iron. And then the clapper, of course, for pressing seams and keeping the heat and steam in there with the wood. This is my other clapper that I get a lot of use from. Um, but this is whole new level so that's delightful and i discovered a site called wawak w-a-w-a-k which is a hundred year old company that sells sewing supplies and they do it online and i got this as well this is a sleeve pressing board yeah. because when you press if you don't have something like this, I mean, you can use a sleeve roll, but those are like this long and you have to keep moving them. This is much more efficient. You put your sleeve on here. You can press the top without crushing the bottom and then flip it over and do the other side. So new purchases, new coat. I'm going to go and work on this while the sun shines in my studio. And then I'll see you guys later for more knitting talk.
Ta-ta for now.